It's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Nicole Younger Halpern uh, as our first invited speaker at this workshop. Nicole is a ITAMP postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University, um, and she works in the area of quantum thermodynamics, uh, and she is combining uh, thermodynamic ide ideas from back in the 19th century with, uh, of course, our 21st century quantum technologies uh, in an area that uh, she likes to call quantum steampunk. And I think we'll hear a bit about that today. Uh, you will also know Nicole as a uh, regular blogger and contributor on the Quantum Frontiers um, uh, blog posts that come out of Caltech. Uh, and I enjoy reading those uh, every month. Thank you very much for those, Nicole. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to hand this over to Nicole Younger Halpern for the first talk. Over to you, Nicole. Wonderful. Thanks very much. I seem unable to start my video. Does someone need to transfer permission for that? I'm told unable to start video. You can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Am I audible? Yes. We can definitely hear you, Nicole. So why uh, don't uh, you just go ahead and start and we'll see if we can get your video going. I when think possible. I have shared, start sharing with someone. Okay, then I'll do that. I'll go ahead and get started and hopefully we can sort out the video as things go along. And thanks very much for the very kind introduction, as well as for the invitation to be here. I'm very excited to be with you here virtually in the, here in the Boston area. It is um, a little late in the evening, um, but I appreciate your uh, getting up somewhat early in the morning to uh, hear about this. So I would like to start with a trip backward in time to our undergrad years. So this trip might induce some feelings of stress. Hopefully it will induce some feelings of elation. And of course, the feelings of greatest elation will be associated with statistical mechanics class. In undergraduate statistical mechanics, we often think about a small system interacting with a big bath. The two exchange things. If the two exchange just heats, the small system may thermalize to the canonical ensemble. If they exchange heat and particles, the small system might thermalize to the grand canonical ensemble and so on and so forth for many different things that can be exchanged like particles of different species and electric charge. These things exchanged, I'm going to call charges because they're conserved globally and that extend beyond electric charge to all the things that can be exchanged and globally conserved. These charges I'm gonna label by Q and index with alpha. When we do quantum statistical mechanics, we represent these things exchanged by Hermitian operators that we implicitly assume commute with each other. This assumption is implicit. We almost never say anything about it, but I'll show that this, argue, that this assumption is in some of our basic arguments about statistical mechanics. But well, we're doing quantum statistical mechanics and non-commutation is one of the hallmarks of non-classicality. So we have to ask, what if these exchanged charges don't commute with each other? Some of our intuitions get thrown off. For instance, it's not clear that the system, the small system can even thermalize. For one thing, these globally conserved charges don't share an eigenbasis because they don't commute. So they don't necessarily share a degenerate eigenspace. It's a degenerate eigenspace that can serve as a microcanonical subspace. And suppose that we go back to the simpler problem that we all know about. Suppose that we have a small system that exchanges heat and particles with a big bath, and we want to prepare the global system so that the small system thermalizes to the grand canonical ensemble. We'll prepare the global system with a well-defined particle number and a pretty well-defined energy in a microcanonical state, in a microcanonical subspace. A microcanonical subspace might not even exist in our case, so why should we expect the small system to thermalize? Also, this Hamiltonian does conserve quantities, so it might have degeneracies. And these degeneracies will be resolved in different ways by different conserved quantities. 
So this degeneracy, these degeneracies likely follow some strange pattern and degeneracies tend to throw wrenches in our expectations about thermalization. Finally, I'll show that at least one derivation of the form of the thermal state breaks down if the conserved charges fail to commute with each other. So we really do need to ask, what if the charges don't commute? This is going to be the topic of this talk. I'm going to start with the earliest history I know of about the subjects. I'll talk about how this, was, this problem was discovered in the intersection of quantum information theory and thermodynamics a few years ago and has led to a lot of work. We argued that it does make sense to think with some caveats of a thermal state of the small system that we call the non-abelian thermal state, the non-abelian suggestive of the non-commutation of the conserved quantities. I'm going to show how we can derive the form of the state from a microcanonical type of arguments. Then I'll show that this theory is really experimentally realizable, and I'll show what sort of a system can thermalize to near such a state. I'll use an example of a chain of qubits and talk about the opportunities opened up by this work. Ah, finally, my, I, I seem able to turn on the video, so hopefully you can see me now. Let's start with the earliest known work about this subject. That was in a paper by E.T. Jaynes. In 1957, he wrote two papers called Information Theory and Statistical Mechanics. The second paper is the quantum paper. He was concerned with the principle of maximum entropy, which more or less tells us that the thermal or equilibrium state of a system is the state that maximizes the entropy upon satisfying certain constraints that we know about this state. One constraint on all quantum states is normalization. Well, we might know some other expectation values of observables in this state. For instance, we might know the average energy and the average particle number. This is the form of the von Neumann entropy of this state. If we maximize the von Neumann entropy subject to these constraints, we find that the state that achieves the maximum is the grand canonical state, as you might expect. Jane said this principle of maximum entropy works even if the observables about which we know some information don't commute with each other. He wrote one paragraph about this non-commutation problem. So when I read his paper, I thought, why didn't you say more? This is one of the most interesting problems. No one ever talks about non-commutation of those things up there in the exponent. In particular, he didn't talk about how systems might get to this state or what sort of systems could even be in such a state. Some followers of Jane's wrote this paper a, a couple of decades later, uh, a few decades later, and they had some good at physical intuition, although they ran into a mathematical roadblock. This problem was discovered in quantum information theoretic thermodynamics a few years ago. There were three groups that all approached this problem at the same time. We wanted to derive the form of the thermal state to, well, first of all, you know, really based on physical principles argue that it makes sense to think about a thermal state, um, more physical principles than James's very strictly information theoretic, information theoretic approach. And fortunately, we all more or less agreed that, again, with some caveats, it does make sense to think about a thermal state of the small system, which we termed the non-abelian thermal state. It looks basically as you would expect. We have an exponential here. This beta is the inverse temperature of the bath. The H sub S is the Hamiltonian of the system of interest, just as in undergraduate statistical mechanics. This sum is over the conserved quantities. Mu alpha is the effective chemical potential of the alpha -th conserved quantity. This Q is the charge of the system of interest. And this partition function normalizes the state. So again, there are some caveats that I'll get to, but this is more or less our answer, our answer which again, looks fairly reassuring, um, but it can really be a pain in the neck to justify. So let's derive the form of this state from a microcanonical sort of an argument. Let's go back to that easy case that we're familiar with from statistical mechanics class. Suppose that we have a small system and a big bath exchanging heat 
and particles. We attribute to the system a tensor product Hilbert space that's divided up like this. We attribute to this small system of interest a Hamiltonian and a particle number operator. And we suppose that the total energy of the global system and the total particle number are conserved. These numbers, the total energy and the total particle number, are associated with a subspace of the global Hilbert space. We call this the microcanonical subspace. And we attribute to the global system a microcanonical state, which is the projector onto that subspace normalized. To calculate the reduced state of the system of interest, we take this microcanonical states and trace out the bath. Then we assume that the coupling is small, and we find that the small system occupies the grand canonical state. Now let's try to go through that derivation, supposing that the conserved quantities don't commute with each other. So this is where there be dragons. We're not sure what's going to happen. I'll be more specific about the setup now. Let's take some number, big N, copies of the small system of interest. For example, we could have a chain of spins in which a couple of the spins form the system of interest. So we're taking the ensemble view of thermodynamics that is, again, a prevalent in undergraduate statistical mechanics. Most of the copies act like an effective bath for the system of interest. Again, we attribute to the global system a tensor product, Hilbert space. And we attribute to each copy charges, such as the energy, the particle number of species A, the particle number of species B, the electric charge, and so on. Not all these conserved quantities commute with each other. Why don't we go the same route that we just went with the grand canonical states? by invoking a microcanonical subspace. The too long don't read version of the argument is what I mentioned before. Such a subspace might not exist. We, if we were to go down this route, would define conserved quantities of the global system. So we would take that first conserved quantity, which might be particle number. We would sum the local particle numbers up to make the global particle number. And we would do the same thing for each other conserved quantity. These serve analogously to the total Hamiltonian and the total particle number and the grand canonical problem. These total system charges might not commute with each other, so they can't necessarily have well-defined values simultaneously. They might not share any degenerate eigen subspace. So we would be looking for an analog of this, the microcanonical subspace in the grand canonical problem, we would want something that looks that we could label like this, another subspace uh, that might not exist, so we need help. A solution is to define an approximate microcanonical subspace to generalize the notion of microcanonical subspace. Now let's tweak our definitions a little and define total charge densities like this. So we take the first charge, which again might be particle number, we take the total particle number, and we divide by the number of copies of the small system. So this is the average charge averaged over all of the copies of the small system. We do the same thing for all of the other charges. And we invoke this mathematical tool proved by the mathematician Ogata, who said that there exist observables wise about them, such that for every charge density, Q tilde alpha, it's approximated by a y sub alpha. And what's more, all of these approximations y sub alpha commute with each other exactly. Furthermore, as the number of copies of the small system in the global system grows large, these approximations become exact. So a commutator between two of the global charges approaches the commutator between two of the approximations, which vanishes. I think of this result in terms of the correspondence principle. The correspondence principle tells us that as systems grow large, they grow classical. 
non-commutation is non-classical. So we should expect that its effects, what's visible about it, gets washed out as the system grows quite large. Furthermore, we define an approximate microcanonical subspace like this. So consider the global system states, let's call them omega total, in which if you measure any total charge, like the total particle number, you have a high probability of obtaining an outcome close to the expected value, which I'll call S sub alpha. So this expected value is analogous in our problem to the total particle number in the grand canonical problem. Each of these global states has most of its support in the approximate microcanonical subspace. So if you take one of these global states and you project it onto the microcanonical subspace, then you take its trace to calculate its supports, you'll find that the trace is somewhat large, at least one minus epsilon where epsilon is small. Furthermore, every such states where you can fairly well predict the outcomes is an approximate microcanonical state. Uh, excuse me, is one of these omega, uh, sorry, every, let me redo that. Every state in the approximate microcanonical subspace, M, is such a global state, omega total, such that you can predict fairly well the outcomes of your measurements. So every total charge has a somewhat well-defined value. We can visualize how these measurement statistics peak somewhat sharply about expected values. I'm going to sketch a plot along the x-axis. I'll plot the possible outcomes of a measurement of one of those global charges. Along the y-axis, I'll plot the probability density associated with obtaining a particular outcome. That probability density peaks about the expected value as alpha, and the width isn't too great. It depends on those, that small parameter I mentioned earlier. There are some other small parameters I didn't mention. And we can use this theorem. So for a given set of small parameters, if the global system is large enough, then this approximate microcanonical subspace exists. So after defining the approximate microcanonical subspace and deriving conditions under which, exists, under which it exists, we attributed to the global system an approximate microcanonical state in analogy with the grand canonical problem. So we attributed to the global system a state that's the projector onto the approximate microcanonical subspace normalized. Then you can prove that if you take this global state and you trace out most of the copies of the small system, the effective bath, then the reduced state of the small system is close on average in a certain way to what you would expect. So here we're comparing the reduced state of the jth system of interest to this non-abelian thermal state that we would expect to be the right answer. We chose as our distance measure the relative entropy, which is defined like this. And its physical significance is it quantifies how well we can distinguish two states, rho and sigma on average. So we took this relative entropy and we averaged it over all of the copies J in our global system. Then we showed that it's not too large. We upper bounded it. These constants here depend on you know, the widths of the peaks that I showed in that graph and the heights, the number of conserved quantities and so on. And this term in the thermodynamic limits as n approaches infinity vanishes. So we've basically shown that the reduced states of the small system of interest is more or less the non-abelian thermal state. So we have achieved our goal, shown that it does make sense with some caveats to think about a thermal state. Over the past few years, this notion of non-commuting conserved quantities in thermodynamics has been propagating across the quantum information theoretic community, the quantum information thermodynamic community. So these are some of the papers written there. There are more, I should add more which has been great to see from a theoretical standpoint. Um, it also led me to ask, well, this is really interesting abstract theory. Can we see it? Can we see it realized? What sort of experimental system could we see it realized in? 
or is it a totally abstract construction that we're really never going to see in the lab or in nature? So can we see a real system equilibrate to near the non-abelian thermal state? That's the question addressed in this paper here with Michael Beverland of Microsoft and Amir Kalev of Quix in Maryland. So we proposed an experiment for seeing the effects that were predicted about. So I'll go through the setup, the preparation procedure, the evolution, the measurements, and numerical simulations that supported our protocol. I'll illustrate with an example setup, although this setup generalizes, so I'll illustrate with a chain of qubits. Let's denote by S our small system of interest. It consists of some small number, little n, of qubits, maybe two qubits. The whole system consists of, again, big N, copies of the small system of interest. The rest of the copies form the effective bath. This whole global system forms a closed quantum many-body system. What quantities make sense to designate as the globally conserved charges? The components of the spin angular momentum, because these Pauli operators don't commute with each other. By sigma alpha j, I denote the alpha component of the spin of qubit j. The conserved, or excuse me, the charges of the system of interest, the local charges, have the forms, these forms. So we take the Pauli operators and we sum them over all of the sites in the small system of interest. We define the global charges as the Pauli operators summed over all of the sites in the lattice. Our Hamiltonian needs to have three properties. First, it should conserve every global charge, every global component to the spin. Second, it should take quanta of the local charges and hop them between subsystems so they can move around the lattice. And third, the Hamiltonian should be non-integrable because integrable Hamiltonians don't sit very well with thermalization and we're trying to see a system thermalized to near the non-abelian thermal state. It would be obnoxious to have to disentangle effects of integrability from effects of non-commuting quantities in thermalization. We can construct such a Hamiltonian by a physical reasoning. We all know the form of the raising and lowering operators for the Z component of this spin. We know how to form a two-body operator that takes one quantum of the Z component of the spin from site J plus one and hops it onto site J and the reverse in superposition. We can transform these Z-type ladder operators into X-type operators by transforming with a unitary, namely the Hadamard. Similarly, we can form operators that take one quantum of the X component of the spin from site J plus one and hop that quantum onto site J and the reverse in superposition. We can do the same thing for Y as well. We need for our Hamiltonian to hop around charges of all types. So when we build the Hamiltonian, we need to take our hopping operator and sum it over all the components of the spin. Then we sum over all the sites. In order for the Hamiltonian to conserve each global charge, it must have equal hopping frequencies for all the directions. You might recognize this operator as the Heisenberg interaction. I don't know of anybody who writes the Heisenberg interaction like this, but you can express the Heisenberg interaction as an operator that takes quanta of all components of the spin, so all of these non-commuting charges, and hops them around while conserving all of the global charges. So that's personally how I like to think of the Heisenberg interaction. We said that the Hamiltonian should be non-integrable. The nearest neighbor Heisenberg interaction is integrable. We can break integrability in two ways. We can make the Hamiltonian have also a next nearest neighbor component, or we can make the lattice greater than one dimensional. So I'm going to take the former option. So our global Hamiltonian has a nearest neighbor term and a next nearest neighbor term. How shall we prepare the global system? According to the earlier part of this talk, we should prepare the global system in an approximate microcanonical subspace. 
that's all well and good to say in theory, but how do you actually prepare a system in an approximate microcanonical subspace, just some thing that was defined abstractly? We came up with two protocols. First, you could prepare the global system in a product state. For example, you could prepare the first spin pointing along the x direction, the second pointing along the y direction, and the third pointing along the z direction, and then you could repeat this pattern. This strategy is quite feasible for ultra-cold atoms and trapped ions. This is doable. Also, you could use generalized measurements, which I could talk about during the question and answer session if somebody is interested. These seem closely related to weak measurements. We've specified a setup and a preparation procedure. Now we need to evolve the system. Under the next nearest neighbor and nearest neighbor Heisenberg Hamiltonian that we constructed. So this Hamiltonian takes local charges of all types and hops them around the lattice. We found numerically that a time linear in the system size suffices. What exactly do we want to predict? Well, according to this quantum information theoretic thermodynamics, we have a prediction about a density operator, which is measurable. But we need to take this notion of non-commuting conserved quantities in thermodynamics from very abstract quantum information theory and bridge it to many body physics, to atomic molecular and optical physics, to condensed matter physics, and to high energy physics, where people can observe these effects that are being predicted about. So we should be using their language in many body physics. And a useful language is this. The eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, often abbreviated as the ETH, is a toolkit that has helped over the past several years describe why chaotic quantum many-body systems thermalize internally. So this is the source of a lot of predictions of, about thermalization in quantum many-body systems. So we needed to take our quantum information theoretic predictions and rephrase them in a way that's consistent with this framework. I'm not going to give many details about what the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis is, except at the end, if anybody is interested, please feel free to ask me and I can talk more about it. Basically, what we need to know now is this, and that this is really the source of a lot of predictions in quantum many-body thermalization, in many-body physics. So suppose that we have a Hamiltonian, an initial global state, and conserved quantities that don't commute that satisfy our assumptions, which can be more general than those for the qubit system. We predict that for some generic local observables O, if you let the system evolve for a long time and measure the expectation value of O, you'll find that it approximately equals the expectation value in the non-abelian thermal state, where this non-abelian thermal state is evaluated on the global system. This inverse temperature beta we define as follows. We take the expectation value of the total Hamiltonian in that global state, the approximate microcanonical state, and we set it equal to the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in the non-abelian thermal state of the whole system. So we take this equation and we solve for beta. We define these effective chemical potentials for the different conserved charges analogously. So we take the expected value from much earlier in the talk, which you might expect to get, or if you measure any globally conserved quantity, then you will with high probability get a value close to S sub alpha. We set that equal to the expectation value of the global charge itself in the non-abelian thermal state. And I won't show details here. I can show details if anyone is interested, but this prediction involves the, gl the global systems being in a non-abelian thermal state. In quantum information theoretic thermodynamics, we predicted that just the small system of interest is in the non-abelian thermal state. In the thermodynamic limits, these two predictions are consistent. If the temperature is high and the chemical potentials are low, and the system consists of qubits, as I described, then you can solve for beta and the mu's analytically, perturbatively. So 
here are formulae for them. The forms of the formulae are not important. I just wanted to show this can be done. You might be concerned. So you might think that this construction of the non-abelian thermal state, um, that could be predicted with just our ordinary tools of thermodynamics or this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which underlies predictions in Benny buddy thermalization, together with what we know about the conservation of, say, the total Z components of the angular momentum. So here was our prediction based on work on the non-abelian thermal state. You might think, okay, this sum here has these three mu alphas, these three effective chemical potentials. They define some vector in real space. Take your z-axis and rotate it into that vector. Call that vector the new z-axis, z tilde. Now we have an exponential whose argument contains only the Hamiltonian and the sigma z term. This system of qubits with a sigma z is equivalent via Jordan-Wigner transformation to a system of free fermions. And the sigma z turns into the particle number operator. So our non-abelian thermal state prediction looks mathematically equivalent to the grand canonical state, which we have known about for many, many, many years. So why bother with all this fuss about non-commuting quantities and the non-abelian thermal state? Because actually, without considering the effects of the non-commutation, we really don't have justification for using our ordinary tools of thermodynamics and many-body thermalization to predict the non-abelian thermal state as the result. Um, our ordinary tools concern Hamiltonians that are non-degenerate. And as I said, um, our Hamiltonians that conserve um, these non-commuting quantities tend to have degeneracies. Our ordinary tools do work in the cases of degeneracies, but only if you apply them to one subspace one, say, particle number sector, if the particle number is conserved. In the case of these non-commuting conserved quantities, there are different conserved quantities that resolve degeneracies in different ways. So we can't focus on just one eigenspace, one sector of any conserved quantity. So our usual assumptions don't work. Furthermore, our ordinary, our ordinary tools concern systems prepared in microcanonical subspaces, which again, may not exist in our problem. And trying to use our ordinary thermodynamic and many body physics tools misrepresents the, the microscopic dynamics. If we're talking about just thermalization to the grand canonical state, then just energy and particles hop around the global system. If we're talking about thermalization to the near the non-abelian thermal states, then conserved quantities that don't commute with each other of all different types hop around the lattice. Finally, we could try to play the same game with the grand canonical states and the canonical state. So here's the, canon the excuse me, the grand canonical states. You could take this h minus mu n and package it up into one effective Hamiltonian h tilde and say, the grand canonical state is just mathematically equivalent to the canonical state. So these problems are really the same. We all know that's not true. That's one reason why we use these two different terms, grand canonical states and canonical state. As grand evolution to the grand canonical state is not the same as evolution to the canonical state, thermalization to the grand canonical state is not the same as thermalization to the non-abelian thermal state. So we really do need to think about the non-commutation of these conserved quantities. We've specified a setup, a preparation procedure, and an evolution. Let's get to the measurement. To satisfy our many-body physics predictions, we just need to measure local observables on the system of interest. But since our small system is small, we might as well perform quantum state tomography and extract the whole density matrix. We simulated this process numerically. We started with one of those product initial states. So the first spin points along the x direction, the next along the plus z, the next along the minus x, the next along the minus z, and then minus x and plus z. All that just is intended to say 
basically, that, that the expected value or expectation value of the global x component of this spin is negative one, the expected value of the y component is zero, and the expected value of the z component is one. And then you take all of the other qubits in the chain and alternate them between down and up, down and up, down and up. I'm going to show a plot along the x-axis. I'll show the total number of qubits in the global system. Along the y-axis, I'll show the relative entropy distance from the final state of the small system of interest to a thermal state. Here's the plot. The most important points are these blue circles. The blue circles represent the distance from the final state of the small system of interest to the non-abelian thermal state. We also compared with the canonical states and the grand canonical states, analogously to in these papers, which are about thermalization to a different equilibrium state by different quantum systems. We see that the blue circles are lowest, so the non-abelian thermal states gives the most accurate prediction. Furthermore, the blue states go, the blue dots move downward as the global system grows larger, so the accuracy grows with the system size. Also, the other states become more accurate predictions as the system size grows. We think that's because the temperature was assumed to be very high, so that we could take advantage of that analytical perturbative expansion that I mentioned earlier. It's difficult to solve for the temperature and all of the chemical potentials if they can have arbitrary values. So we, um, it's difficult to solve for them numerically because you have to solve a bunch of matrix equations. We helped ourselves out by supposing that the temperature is fairly high and the chemical potentials are fairly low. If the temperature is high, then all thermal states look similar to each other. They look similar to the maximally mixed state. So we think that that's why these predictions are uh, converging and next work is needed on lower temperatures. Here we have the best fit to the blue circles, that is a polynomial in the total number of copies of the small system. We can compare that fit with the abstract theoretical prediction that we saw much earlier in the talk. We predicted that if you take the final states or the state of the small system of interest, you compare it to the non-abelian thermal states via the relative entropy and then average over all copies of the small system, that distance will be upper bounded with this polynomial that goes like the number of copies of the small system n to the negative one half. This fit is like n to the negative five halves, which we thought an interesting comparison. The, these numerics suggest that this abstract theory is loose or at the mesoscale, is dominated by these transients, which will wash out as this global system grows larger. So this work, up open, this work opens up a number of opportunities. First, this experiment can be performed. We were especially focusing on ensuring that the protocol is feasible for ultra-cold atoms and trapped ions, but a number of other platforms seem viable. Second, there's the possibility that I mentioned during the earlier part of this talk, that the non-commutation of the conserved charges might hinder thermalization to some extent. So our numerics showed that the small system thermalizes to near the non-abelian thermal state. The prediction is that there's a little extra distance between the final state of the small subsystem and the thermal state than there would be in the absence of non-commutation for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Hindrance of thermalization is useful for quantum memories. We need materials that retain information about their initial conditions rather than just flowing to featureless thermal states. Also, from a more fundamental standpoint, hindrance to thermalization is of great fundamental interest because it implies that we have a system that can sort of resist the second law of thermodynamics. Today, we know of one, two, three, four mechanisms for hindering thermalization in quantum many body systems. There's a possibility that non commutation of conserved charges could provide a fifth mechanism. 
I mentioned that there is outside of the quantum information theoretic community, this other community in many body physics and atomic molecular and optical physics, condensed matter physics, and high energy physics that's very interested in quantum many body thermalization. And it's been developing loads of wonderful toolkits over the past several years to describe quantum many body thermalization. A few examples appear here. Those tools haven't been generalized to accommodate or focus on non-commutation of conserved quantities. So we need to finish this bridge between fields and generalize these toolkits. Then use these toolkits to see what happens to the transport and storage of energy and charges when conserved quantities don't commute with each other. Finally, we showed that you can construct in the lab a system that will thermalize to near the non-abelian thermal states, but non-abelian symmetries appear in nature, for example, in high energy physics. So it's possible that some of these, some of this process occurs naturally. So in summary, we saw that this notion of non-commutation of conserved quantities in thermodynamics has been in large part overlooked for many, many decades, somewhat surprisingly, even though it was seen early on by E.T. Jaynes. It was discovered a few years ago in quantum information theoretic thermodynamics, where we argued for the existence of a non-abelian thermal states. We derived its form from an approximation to the microcanonical subspace, a generalization of the notion of the microcanonical subspace to accommodate non-commutation, as well as from some other derivations that I didn't show. We proposed an experimental protocol that is illustrated with a chain of qubits for realizing thermalization to this non-abelian toward at, to at least near this non-abelian thermal state, and there's a lot left to be done. But thanks very much for your time. Thanks very much, Nicole. Uh, let's all give Nicole a virtual round of applause. Um, now we're going to use the uh, uh, Q&A function. So please type in any questions you have into the Q&A and um, we will start fielding questions. Maybe while the attendees get started on that, I had a question, Nicole, um, and it related um, to just this, um, this new uh, obstruction to thermalization as an alternative approach to quantum memories. I'm just um, uh, wondering what, what would you look for in terms of uh, sort of how you could, you know, I, I understand you have a limit to thermalization here, but what would you look for in terms of actually protecting quantum information during that process? Yeah, we would look at the distance of the final states of the small system of interest from the non-abelian thermal state. Granted, we're looking at finite size systems because of what I talked about earlier in the talk. If the global system grows very large, then we expect by the correspondence principle that the system will grow somewhat classical and the effects of non-commutation will be wiped out. So it does make sense to focus on the mesoscale, but anytime you have a finite system, you might expect finite size effects to also cause some hindrance to thermalization. So we would compare the distance of the states, the final state of the small system of interest to the appropriate thermal states in the presence of non-commuting conserved quantities and in the absence. Um, so first we would focus it on just quantifying that distance and then we would have to start to unravel um, what is the extra information that is retained about the initial conditions? How could you take the, say, average final state of the system of interest and decompose it in some way? That's a sort of combination of the non-abelian thermal states and information about the initial state. That's great. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so please, everyone, put your, put your questions into the uh, Q&A. Don't be shy.
everyone who's been shy too early in the morning for uh, questions on uh, this end of the world. Um, well, uh, if there are no further questions, let's thank uh, Nicole again for a great talk. And uh, so before everyone me. runs off, um, I'm going to hand over to Maria, who's going to uh, tell us a bit about how uh, Gather Town. Um, oh, wait, so something's coming through. Uh, somebody says they can't ask a question in the Q&A. Is any, oh, <laughs> this might be a technology issue. Um, uh, so if you're having, is there, yeah, can you ask it in the chat? Is there any, yeah, or raise a hand. Is there any way for our audience to communicate with us? Um, well, so I'm going to hand it over uh, to Maria to introduce uh, Gather Town. And if you can um, uh, throw in any questions into either the chat or the Q&A while she's discussing, we'll make sure to pass them on to uh, Nicole. Oh, Wentz just came through. Um, so it's from uh, Jack, and he asked, could you uh, talk a little bit about the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis? Sure. Let me stop sharing my screen for a moment. So I'll get to the right slide and then share again. Here we go. Okay, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis we said is this toolkit developed in quantum many body physics to help us understand why chaotic quantum many body systems thermalize internally. So here are the ingredients that go into the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. We have some quantum many body system, maybe some ions trapped in a lattice. It has some many body Hamiltonian, which will decompose like this. So there are energies E sub M and eigenstates M. Usually we assume that the Hamiltonian is non-degenerate. Often people work with Hamiltonians that can serve the particle number operator, say. In that case, we'll focus on one sector of the particle number operator, and we don't have to worry about degeneracies there. Then we pick some local observable O. We also have some initial state of the global system. It might be in a microcanonical states such that it has weights on just close together energy or eigenstates of the Hamiltonian associated with just close together energies. It's a pure state. Yeah, so these um, energy weights of the states are peaked sharply about some energy. And this state evolves in time to what you would expect. So I'm actually not going to state the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis here. Um, I could, I could actually dig up some other slides that show that, but what's really relevant to this talk is an implication of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which is a claim about the Hamiltonian and the observable O. Um, the two of them can together satisfy the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Um, and if they do, then the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis implies that the system thermalizes, uh, which is formalized in the following way. So suppose that you take the limits as the time approaches infinity. You measure the expectation value of your local observable. That about equals the expectation value of the observable in the canonical states of the whole system. So this left-hand side is a prediction from many-body quantum physics. It's a prediction about pure states of isolated quantum many-body systems. This right-hand side is the canonical prediction of thermalization from ordinary thermodynamics. So this thermalization implication of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis shows how with quantum many-body physics, we can recapitulate statements of thermalization from thermodynamics. Uh, 
Um, and we've just had another uh, question come through. Um, uh, do the Y operators, uh, which are exactly commuting with each other, somehow appear in the approximate thermal state? Is there any explicit expression for the Y operators in terms of the QJs? The approximate, okay, uh, I'm not sure exactly which state is referred to, maybe the approximate microcanonical states, which is the state of the whole system, or the non-abelian thermal states, which is the state of the small system of interests. Um, neither of those depends on why. We use the operators why in our proof that the final states of the small, or the state of the small system of interest is close to the non-abelian thermal state. And I don't believe that we have, or that we used explicit expressions for why uh, Ogata's paper was somewhat long. Uh, we use just one little part of it. It's possible that she says more there about the forms of the whys. Um, okay, thanks very much, Nicole, uh, once again for a fantastic talk.